Well, good morning. It is uh, really awesome to be able to be here. As Enoch said, we've gotten to know each other um, over the last year or so. Actually, we were on a fishing trip in Montana, and uh, it was uh, fun to kind of watch him use his skills. So this is totally different, uh, the way that you're fly fishing. This isn't the right way to do fishing. So he's going to give me an experience of real island fishing, not this week, but another time uh, when I return. But it is so, it's so good to be here. And uh, you truly do have a great uh, pastor here. You you might not know this, but even on the mainland, there's all this chitter chatter about what a great leader and preacher he is. And to be honest, I'm a little intimidated to preach here. So yeah, give a give a round of applause for your pastor. And uh, and uh, so it's an honor that he's given up some time uh, from the pulpit uh, for me to be able to uh, share. And I'm very very excited to do that. Uh, as he mentioned, I've been in ministry as you know for a long time since uh, I really committed my life to Christ in college. And because of that, most people know me just as a pastor, and they see me up on stage or on a screen or platform or whatever. And so I often get asked, well, Danny, what are your hobbies? What are the things that you like to do? And I have two major hobbies. Uh, the first one uh, is playing ice hockey. I grew up in Wisconsin, very near to Canada, and so um, you know, played hockey my whole life, and I still continue to do that and play on a men's league. Uh, but my other hobby, uh, is building things. So over the years, I've owned some houses, and I just, I love uh, to, to build different things, whether it's cabinets or, you know, to, I, I redid a fireplace of, you know, I, I built this whole coffee bar, so lots of different things like that. And today's uh, sermon title is called Lessons from a Master Builder. And so you might be thinking, oh man, that seems pretty arrogant. This guy's going to come here, call himself a master builder. Well, understand this. I'm actually not a master builder at all because I grew up with a dad that didn't really fix a lot of things. And so as I grew and had my houses and built things, um, I learned from YouTube. So I'm, I, I kind of consider myself a hack uh, it sometimes takes me two or three times to be able to figure out how to tile a floor or do whatever. Uh, but what we're going to learn from the real master builder today is the Apostle Paul as he gives some lessons. So this is what I'd like to do. We're going we're gonna to open up in some prayer, and then we're going to dive into God's Word together today and look at what it means to be a master builder. So why don't you bow your heads and pray with me. Heavenly Father, we do just praise you and thank you so much for who you are and already that we've been able to give honor and glory to your name for who you are. And we just invite your Holy Spirit right now, not only in the preaching and teaching, but also the listening and applying of your holy word. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so if you have your Bibles with you, I want to invite you to open up to 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 10 through 16. I believe it's going to be projected as well. And just to kind of give you a little hint of how we're going to do this, I'm going to read the whole passage right now. But then what we're going to do is we're going to walk through and we're going to make um, four different uh, observations as we uh, walk through this, uh, as we walk through this, five different observations as we walk through this passage. So I'll give you a second to get there. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 10 through 16. According to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care of how he builds upon it. For no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw, each one's work will become manifest, for the day will disclose it, because it will re be revealed by fire. Fire will test what sort of work each one has done. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. And if anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss. Though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Do you not know you are God's temple and the spirit, God's spirit dwells in you? 
If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. All right, well, you can hold your place right there if you have your uh, Bible. I wanted to start out just with a little bit of a context so that you understand uh, what's happening here, give you a little bit of background. See, the Apostle Paul in 50 AD, he planted this church in the city of Corinth. Uh, and uh, he stayed there for about a year and a half, and he boldly proclaimed the gospel. And it was amazing. People that don't, didn't know Jesus heard this gospel message. They became followers of Christ. And you know, where there was no church that existed before, and this church plant that happened uh, began to grow. And after about a year and a half, the apostle Paul uh, left this church to go plant another church in the city of Ephesus. Now, when he left that church, after some time had transpired, uh, the church took a little bit of a turn for the worse. There were some problems that were happening in the church. There was immorality that was going on. Uh, there was some bad teaching, some bad theology that was happening. And then there was even uh, relational issues that were happening within the church. There was a church clicks uh, that, were, that were going on. And a part of this, actually, as I read this, is a little bit refreshing to me. Uh, n- not because I think that, you know, relational problems in a church are good, but it almost kind of makes it a little bit normal. Like we have problems in every single church and people fighting with one another in relations. It's like, okay, well, if even the, the churches that the Apostle Paul planted had church problems, it kind of makes us feel a little bit normal. Um, And and what was happening here is that the people were actually kind of um, creating these church cliques of who they uh, thought the, you know, the the leader is that they would follow. So that would be like if you were to think of here, it's like, well, well, I like Pastor Enoch the most, so I'm going to follow. Oh, well, I like Pastor Daryl better, and I think the way, the stuff that he says, and so all of this stuff is going on, and the Apostle Paul is like, you idiots. And so that's really what the purpose of this letter is, is he writes back to them and says, this, you guys need to understand, if you're going to build the kingdom of God, if you're going to build the church, then I want to give you some instructions as a master builder. And so let's look at this uh, together And as you're kind of thinking through this, understand that he's really talking to, thank you, uh, I like Pastor Daryl the most. (laughs) You're up next, so. Uh, So understand that for each of us, this could be applied as in building the church, but even in the back of your mind, I want you to think of how this can be applied to just building the kingdom in general, building your marriage, building the ministry that you're involved in. We'll get to especially some application right at the end, but just thinking through those things. So let's start with verse 10 again. He says, according to the grace God given to me, like a master builder, I have laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each of you take care upon how he builds, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. So here's, if you're, if you're a note taker, Uh, You can write this down, Master Builder, observation number one is that the foundation is the most important, and that foundation is Christ. Okay, the foundation is the most important, and the foundation is Christ. That's the first thing he starts out in saying. And if you've ever uh, gone through the process of building a house, and I don't know how construction works here, if it's as important, um, but... In, uh, on, on the mainland with um, you know, houses, the foundation is so important. Uh, as my wife and I, we were a young married couple and we went around our friends, family, realtors, they said, hey, just make sure that when you're looking at houses that you get one that has a good foundation. It's really important. So we did on our first house, we were looking at all these different things and found this one house and you know, had a nice kitchen, had this beautiful like uh, uh, fireplace, all sorts of um, you know oak doors, and you know beautiful house. And we're like, oh man, this is great. And then we walk down into the basement, and the wall there, the foundation, was bowed in about an inch and a half. So so not that much, but the wall was 
you know, bowed in just a little bit. And like every wise 20-something would do, we bought the house, right? We thought, it's only an inch and a half. It's no big deal. Well, every single year from, you know, the water pressure from the outside and the ground, it went, you know, one and a half, two and a half. And uh, eventually when we needed to sell the house, we had to invest a whole bunch of money to have the foundation repaired and dug out and refilled in with concrete. And so the foundation is so important. And it's the same thing as we talk about being a master builder, being a master builder for the kingdom. And, and there's two things that are important to this verse, is that the Apostle Paul says, hey, just so you know, when I came to Corinth and I planted the church, the foundation is already laid. So you guys don't need to be arguing about that at all. You can't go back. You're not going to redo what this church is established on. And then he makes very clear, and this is not just for the churches that Paul plants, but for every church that's planted, he says the foundation is Christ. Now that metaphor that the Apostle Paul says is not his own. You know where he ripped that off from? Jesus. And if you're going to rip anything off from anyone. So this is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter 7. He says, anyone who hears the words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who builds his house upon what? The rock. And the rain fell and the floods came. The winds blew and beat on that house. And uh, because it was founded on the rock, it stands. But everyone who hears the words of mine, remember this is Jesus talking, and, and, and does not do them is like the foolish man who built his house on the sand. And when the rain came, the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that ho house, it fell with a great fall. So even Jesus himself refers to himself as the foundation. And in other parts of scripture, Jesus is referred to as the cornerstone which means he's not only like the entire foundation, but he is the, the bedrock, the most important piece that holds everything together. And so even as you reflect on and think about the church here and the ministry that you're, that you're involved in, that you maybe even volunteer in, understand that Jesus is that foundation. Paul recognizes too that he built the foundation, but then he left, right? And so if you pick your Bibles back up, we'll move on to our next observation, verse 12, where we left off. He says, now if anyone does build that foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw. So our master builder observation number two is to choose your materials wisely. Choose your materials wisely. Now, I told you before that I love building things, and part of the uh, reason that, you know, that, that I did this is because that when I was young, I didn't have any money, so I would, you know, invite a contractor over and say, you know, like, how much is this going to cost, thinking it would be, you know, pretty inexpensive, and they'd give me the quote, and I'm like, no way, I got to figure out, I got to figure out how to do my own tile floor, uh, type of thing. But one of the things that I learned over time, especially as I did have to hire contractors to do things, I just love this. This is what they would say. They would say, with your project, you have the option of three different things. Inexpensive, um, high quality, or fast. But you only get to choose two. Okay, think about that for a moment. Inexpensive, fast, and high quality. If, if it's going to be inexpensive and fast, not going to be high quality. Or you can pick high quality and fast, but it's not going to be inexpensive. So you can see this kind of triangle here. And I, I think that so much of this is true even as we look at what it means to be a master builder in building the kingdom because we often try to go fast and we try to go inexpensive and we try to use low quality things. And here the apostle Paul is saying, hey, you basically have um, uh, options here. He, he breaks them up into two contrasting things. You've got gold, silver, and precious stones. Those are high quality materials. Or you've got wood, hay, and straw. Now, I, what I want to do is, like, if you like 
kind of like theology and that type of thing, you can listen for the next like two minutes. If you don't like that, you don't like theology, I, I'm literally giving you permission. You can go online right now and maybe, I don't know, do your grocery, you know, do your grocery. But this is just something that I was thinking about. This is like bonus material, okay? And by the way, this is a brand new fresh sermon and so some of it I'm just kind of trying out. So you can tell me like, take it out in your next sermon. It was boring, I didn't like it. But here's, here's kind of what I was thinking. As he is as he's talking about being a master builder, to me it seems like the foundation is evangelism and justification by faith and the gospel. Okay, th- those terms, because if you know those terms, those um, happen, justification by faith happens in a moment. It's when you're saved. It's when you say yes to Jesus. It's the gospel. And that foundation, as he gives his metaphor, can't be undone. We're going to look at that a little bit later. Whereas everything that's built upon it is like this lifelong process. That is sanctification and discipleship. And that can look different. People do discipleship different ways and understand that sanctification, again, it's the lifelong process of being conformed and transformed into the image of Christ. Okay, so I, I just, I, I like to have a little bit of that theological framework as we go on here, but what he says here is then to choose in the sanctification, in the discipleship phase of building, choose wisely how you build. Okay, so now everyone, welcome back. Okay, you're done with your grocery shopping. Okay, here, here's, here is what I would say is even the meat and potatoes, if you listen to nothing else. Now this next part is the most practical application that I can give you in being the master builder because it actually deals with what we have, what I would say some, um, you know, some responsibility in. And, and that is, is that he says, all right, what, uh, are, are you gonna use gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, or straw? I wanna offer to you some, what I would say are examples Okay, this is not saying, these are not in the Bible. His metaphor doesn't say these are what they are, these exact three. So you could come up with your own. But these are my own personal reflections. And definitely as I've you know, been in ministry for a while, I've interacted with a lot of pastors, a lot of ministry leaders, and I've witnessed a lot of things, good and bad. I've witnessed the gold, silver, precious stones, but I've also witnessed the wood, hay, and straw. And if I'm real honest, I've used both in my own ministry. Okay, so, so here's, here's, here's what I would say. As examples of gold, silver, precious stone is if you build with grace, truth, and patience. So I'm gonna, say, I'm gonna give back that just a little bit for you. So if we're to build with grace, That means that we're offering grace to the people that we disciple and that we're in ministry with. Now, I think that this is a challenge for Christians, which is absolutely crazy, because what? We've received the most amazing grace, right? We don't deserve to have a relationship with God through Jesus Christ, and so we're just dumped on with grace. And and we live in that grace for weeks, months, maybe a year, and then we just become really good at judging other people. I mean, come on, church, right? Don't we need to be reminded of the great grace that was given to us so that as we're building the church that we extend that grace to other people? So that's like one of the most important components or materials that we ought to constantly have in the back of our mind as we're building the church, building the ministry, building our marriage, building in relationships is to be able to have grace. But right along with that is truth. And by truth, what I mean is, of course, the word of God. This is filled with truth. And I think that the challenge with truth is that we've become so accustomed to being nice to people or being politically correct and so sometimes it's really difficult as we're building the church to be able to say like oh hey um you know here here's what god's word says because we want to be liked by them we don't want to offend them and there are times where we need to say hey this is what god's word says and when you put those two together grace 
And truth, I mean, you start to build a building that I think uh, reflects the very heart of God. And then the final one, grace, truth, and patience. And this is hard, and I'll admit this as a pastor. If you're a ministry leader, you probably know this as well too. We want to see God do good things really, really fast. And granted, sometimes God does. We've got stories of amazing miracles. Even the early church, you know, people were coming to Christ. The the church grew by thousands. So yes, we have examples of that. But most of the time in ministry, when you're building something of value and of worth, or if you're building and discipling someone, it takes time. And so as a master builder yourself, Just keep that in the back of your mind as you're working with people, and some people might take a few steps forward, a few steps back. You've got some grace in there, some truth. You've got some patience as well. I want to offer to you wood, hay, and straw. I know I mentioned a little bit in contrast to the grace, truth, and patience, but wood, hay, and straw, the ones that I came up with were gimmicks, guilt, and selfish ambition. Now, the gimmicks one, it it could be confusing because um, I'm all about being strategic, right? As as the church, we can be strategic. We can use different things to, you know, people that wouldn't normally come to church. Maybe there's some sort of outreach idea or even using marketing or, you know, being on a website or whatever. I'm not saying that churches should not do that because I'm all about that. And I think that you can be very strategic. The problem becomes when churches or ministries only use gimmicks to be able to grow the church, okay? And, and what you'll find out is they, and it, sometimes it can be even hard to watch because you actually see some initial fruit or you see some initial growth and it's like, wow, that, that, that worked for them. Like, they're, you know, they're gonna hand out money for people to come to church or something like that and all of a sudden their church doubles in size, surprise, you know? Um, But to be really careful that a church would be based on gimmicks. The second one uh, for for the hay, the wood, hay, and straw, would be guilt. And can I tell you why people use guilt to build the kingdom of God? Because it works. It works short term. And you can say, you know what? What? you really need to come to church or blah, blah. I, I know Pastor Enoch doesn't do this. I'm talking about other, you know, other churches or whatever. Or in your small group, your, 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 uh, your, your rooted small groups where it's like, hey, you know, you, you know if, you, if you really like me as a friend or if you really love Jesus, then you're gonna show up. And it's like, okay, I guess you're right. And, and you show up. But after a while, the weight of, of guilt Eventually, people go, I can't do this anymore. And as I read scripture, things are, we're, we're not to be motivated by guilt. And so after a while, guilt doesn't work. And then the final one, and this is my favorite one, is selfish ambition. And re- remember that uh, I shared before that, hey, I've used, I, I, I've, I've been in the gold, silver, precious stones, but I've used some hay, wood, and straw as well, and the reason why I can, I, I can share this is because I feel like I've learned from this myself, especially as a young pastor, young church planter, and you know, we, we started out you know, this small little church and pretty soon we began to grow, and, and it started so pure, it started so much with people coming to Christ and life transformation, and as things grew, there's all of a sudden you just get this like feeling and you all of a sudden want more power and more people and more influence and more notoriety and there was some times and I'm really thankful I had people around me that loved me that were willing to sit me down and say you know what uh Danny some of the some of the attitude stuff that I see in your heart some of the selfish ambition that that's not a that's not a godly thing that's not the reason to grow your church. I mean, scripture says, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but to consider others better than yourselves. And so we have a choice how we're going to build. The foundation is laid. The foundation is Jesus. What type of materials are you going to use? What type of materials are you going to use? Because that brings us 
to our next verse. Verse 13, each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. So master builder observation number three is your building will be tested. Your building will be tested. Now I know for some, this could create maybe a little bit of anxiety, right? Especially if you were, you know, in school, like have this kind of like this final exam that's always like over your head and you maybe even like are diagnosed with testing anxiety. But I want to flip this and to see the positive uh, side of this. If, if scripture is true, which I believe that it is, and it says that God is going to test what we build and if we're going to use wood, hay, or straw, or um, if we're going to use gold, silver, precious stones, or wood, hay, and straw, and it's going to be tested. What this means then is that God does care about how we build and, and what, we, what we build. To, to me, this is, this is actually an encouraging thing. I mean, what if God was up there and he's like, okay, you know, go and make disciples of all nations and plant churches and do all this stuff and didn't really care. I mean, have you ever had that before? Maybe you had a class and you're working so hard and it's like, no, test me on this. This is, I want to show you, I want to demonstrate to you the care that I've taken. Well, we learn from scripture that God does care and and that we will be tested in these things. It says that there will be this fire that is, uh, is held up to us. Now, this specifically says that this will become, this test, will, that will become manifest for the, the day will disclose it. Now, in your Bibles, because um, each translation might be a little bit different, does, does everyone have a capital D in theirs? Look, look at your, look in your Bibles. Everyone have a, cap, raise your hand if you have a capital D. Okay, so m- majority of you do. Because this is referring to you know, Christ's return or the final judgment. So like I said, it's, it's kind of like the final exam. But the other part of this as I was reflecting on this and, and studying this passage is that knowing that God tests us in our kind of our, our final work, our final exam, is it helps us even to understand a little bit as we're tested along the way. So think about this, if you've done this in school before, if you ever had, it's like, hey, you're going to have this pop quiz, maybe midterm or maybe partway through. You're, you're not graded on it. It's not part of your, your, uh, your final you know, grade. But why does the teacher do that? To kind of just show you, what, where are you at? Are you comprehending? Are, are you doing well? Because here's the reality. Yeah, we're going to be tested at the end by the Lord, but we have lots of little mini tests that happen along the way. And I love this because James 1, 2 through 4 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. And let that perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in nothing. See, don't you love that? Because sometimes when we face trials, we think, oh, well, maybe God's mad at me, right? Maybe God is just disappointed where really it's God's love and God's grace that's saying, a little bit more to the left, a little bit more to the right, because I want you to ace that final exam, right? That fire's going to come, and I want that when you come through to the other side that you've got this gorgeous, beautiful building because you built as a master builder. Because the reality is that no matter how how long you've been a believer, that there comes times where there is a testing of your faith. And as as hard as that is, and, and sometimes it's really difficult for people to be like, consider a pure joy, do you understand what I'm going through? It's so difficult. But to know why would we consider a pure joy? We consider it pure joy because God is care, he, he cares and concerns for who you are and what you're doing and how you're stewarding the gifts that he has given you. 
All right, let's keep moving along here. We've got two more, verse 14 and 15. If the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. Okay, so observation number four is that rewards are promised. All right, observation four is rewards are promised. Here's why this part of this passage is so important. If you look closely at it, we'll start even with kind of the negative part of it, is that it says, let's say you built with wood, hay, or straw, right? And then all of a sudden you, you know, you get to heaven or the return of Christ happens and, you know, it's tested with fire and the whole thing just burns up. Notice what the passage says. That person does not lose their salvation, right? It, it doesn't, you don't lose your salvation. So this is going back to why I was saying before, theologically, that the foundation that is set by Jesus, that is that permanence that happens, that justification by faith that happens, and that is set, sealed, done. But now everything that you build upon it, that could go through, and maybe you just all of a sudden become you know, self-absorbed, selfish ambition, or you literally do nothing with it, and it gets to this place. But what that, again, brings us back to is it brings us back to the heart of the gospel. We don't build something to go, hey, God, look what I built for you. Now are you going to let me into heaven? That's works-based theology, but instead, we're saved by the grace of Jesus. Not because of what we have done, but because of what he has already done on the cross. And so in that, I'll tell you what, there's such a freedom in that. You know what that makes me do? That takes the fear and the guilt and all of that away to, to know that I'm already secure in him. And now as I'm building these things for him and building with quality, that there's just gravy on top, right? Now, I don't know what the rewards are. Okay, I, I, I'm, I mean, it could probably be a whole sermon. I'll let the smart pastors and theologians dive into you know, what, the, what all the rewards are. But just to know that God's saying, you know what? What you do actually matters. What you do actually matters. Here's why I think that this is also important. For some of you, what God has called you to in your kingdom building is very visible. Okay, if, if you're a pastor of a church, you might have a very visible ministry. There's people, there's buildings, there's books, there's invitations to speak at conferences. But for some of you, you might have what I would consider invisible buildings that you're building. Right, it might be your small group. For for some of you, it's it's your marriage. It's building into your children, and and no one really gets to see what's happening. But can I tell you this? God does see. God does see. I, I love this. This is what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six. He says, "But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you." Okay, now I know that that was specific about giving, you know, like, hey, you know, you don't need to shout and prove to everyone, but it's the same thing with rewards and ministry here, that there's going to be times where no one sees that you have taken the time, that you have used gold and silver and precious stones. Maybe you're discipling someone, maybe it's your rooted small group that you're doing, and you're like, man, I just want to take extra time. I want to study our passage. I want to individually follow up with each person. I want to make sure that people are cared for. And at the end of the day, you know who knows what you did in your small group? Nobody. No one sees it. Pastor doesn't even see it. Uh, you're not on the news for like, wow, this person did this amazing ministry. Guess what they did in their rooted small group? But God sees it, and you will be rewarded. All right, final one. Final one here. Our last uh, verse is verse 16. Uh, do, you, uh, do you not know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, 
God will destroy, will destroy him. For God's temple is holy and you are that temple. So here's master builder observation number five, our last one. You are the builder and the building. Okay, you're the builder and the building. So I'm not going to re-preach the whole sermon, but you can see then how each of this will kind of fall into the, the previous ones. How amazing is this whole time the Apostle Paul is talking about something that you are building for God, but at the same time, in the same passage, and we'll read other passages, other passages in the Bible that say as you're building something, you actually become part of that building and that God dwells in you. So as you're discipling other people, as you're pouring into other people, God is not only working through you, but he is working in you at the same time. And I love this. This is what Ephesians uh, 2 says. He says, you are fellow citizens and saints and members of the household of God. Catch this, same thing. Built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the cornerstone. In him, the whole structure is being joined together and grows into a holy temple in the Lord. In him, you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. That means that as you're building, and let's even talk about in the context of this local church, this local expression of, of, of the kingdom of God, is that God is working through you. Some of you have individual ministries and that, but that really God is building a house for what purpose but to dwell in. That means as we're building something, it's not just to build something in vain, but to experience the very presence of God. Now, I didn't, you know, I didn't know the different announcements and things that you know, exactly were, were, were going on here, but I honestly, as I was sitting down here and Enoch was giving these, uh, giving these uh, different announcements, and he was talking about these rooted uh, small groups, um, I, just, I got chills because I remember back when our church was committed to this, um, that's where we saw God work in absolutely amazing ways. I mean, it seems so simple to be able to say like, okay, well, you're going to go over to somebody else's house and you're going to open scripture together and, you know, you're, you're, you're going you're gonna to pray together. Um, but there's not a professional pastor maybe there or a prof- But I got to tell you that this is how God works because you begin to know one another you know one another struggles, you're able to pray, you can ask um, questions about scripture, you can dive in together. And, and I just have a feeling that for some of you, and maybe some of you right now are just even on the edge, should I do this thing, it's kind of weird, what if, I, what if I go to this and they ask me some hard questions and I, I don't have the answers to it? Great, that's what it's all about. You become vulnerable, and here's what God does. Brick by brick, he starts building the body of Christ so that the very presence of God can dwell. How awesome to experience then the very presence of God. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you so much that you, that you love us, that you did not let us just sit in our sin and be separated from you, but instead you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die a brutal death, that we might be reconciled to you, that you would give us your Holy Spirit, that we would be changed and transformed. God, I, just, I wanna pray for, for, for this church right now that you would do something special, even as they look forward to 2024, that you would build something significant here. Not that anyone can take credit for it, not because it's having a bigger name or influence or a bigger building, but Lord, that your temple would be built here, that your presence would dwell here. 
Lord, I just pray, I know there's some leaders out there right now, some master builders, and they just think, I'm, I'm not worthy. I, I don't know anything. I haven't gone to Bible school. But Lord, that right now that you would even speak in their spirits and say to them, you are a master builder. I've got, I've, I've got some plans. And you're going you're gonna to be my hands and feet, and you're going to build something. You're going to be part of building this church. Lord, I pray against any sort of insecurity, any sort of stuff from the past that Satan would love to say, you, you can't do this. You're not, you're, you're not worthy. We know why we are worthy because of what Jesus did for us on the cross. And Lord, I do. I pray for the pastors here that they would have a humility working together, helping to equip and to empower each person so the stuff just doesn't happen here on a Sunday, but the, throughout the week and in the workplace and in the home and in marriages, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified. God, I, I pray if there is anyone here that has never said yes to you, that maybe this is even their first time to church and things may even seem a little bit weird and confusing or whatever, but they just recognize that they're, they're a sinner separated from you, but that it God, that you love them so much that you even brought them here today to hear this message, that they would say, yes, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe that you died on the cross for the forgiveness of my sins. I surrender my life to you. I commit my life to you. God, make me part of this building, this building of the church. Use me, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen.